Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to uh, present to you and introduce to you today uh, our first talk in a series of uh, talks, <laughs> which are hosted by the Design++ Plus Plus, uh, initiative. Uh, in the beginning, I want to say a bit about this Design++ Plus Plus initiative. Uh, the objective here is to form basically an initiative to develop digitally augmented design tools and uh, computational processes that uh, will allow in the future the experts, meaning architects, engineers, and construction managers, to uh, increase uh, productivity, uh, improve the quality of the building, and uh, substantially reduce the ecological and uh, economic impact of the AEC sector. Uh, given that uh, overall target, uh, there is a core team of uh, members uh, trying to reach that through this Design++ Plus Plus initiative. Uh, we gave it here. There's an advisory board of uh, professors who are contributing to uh, our Design++ Plus Plus initiative. There is a steering committee. It's also consisting of uh, already appointed professors at ETH and a newly uh, founded professorship, which will be uh, put a person in in the future. And there is this senior researchers where uh, I am uh, part of that. So my name is uh, Michael Klaus. And uh, as you can see here, there is a team of uh, three other people I'm very glad to work with. Uh, they are all attending today the talk and uh, maybe uh, we can uh, say a, or, uh, a few more words uh, in the after made of the talk uh, on us. And uh, I want to highlight that since yesterday, uh, we launched a YouTube channel for our Design++ Plus Plus speaker series. Uh, as I already said today, the kickoff talk, and uh, we are at the moment setting up a, a very nice list of presenters, uh, worldwide experts in the uh, region of applying AI to design in some senses. Uh, we are establishing a recurring event on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, or Thursdays. Depends still a bit on the availability of our speakers, but yeah, we will let you know in, in very due time on that. So please have a look at the channel. The talks will be recorded uh, that yeah, people who are not able to uh, attend when the uh, presentations are given, uh, that they are enabled to have a look at these great talks. So please share this information also with interested colleagues. So as I said before, I'm very happy to be part of that Design++ Plus Plus initiative. Um, if you have questions or research ideas uh, in any sense uh, related to that, bringing AI to the AEC sector, reach out to me or my uh, yeah, nice colleagues, uh, as you see here. Uh, so we are available. Uh, via mail or phone or in person sometimes <laughs> because due to COVID some of us shifted to homework uh, home office but yeah reach out to us yeah the words so far on the design plus plus initiative uh, as I said uh, we are very happy to host our first talk together with Kim Wantley who is uh, Joining us from Autodesk today, he will give a talk on generative design in the AEC space, um, a bit on the background. So Kim worked as a software architect, uh, integrating IoT and BIM uh, within the Forge platform, and especially in generative design for the AEC space uh, with Autodesk. Uh, in Autodesk company, he had several roles in several countries, and uh, yeah, he is engaging as a developer and computational design uh, communicator, and he's providing technical content as today with his talk. Uh, I know that he has a great blog. I'm also following it, and I got really good inspirations on uh, yeah further stuff which he posted. So please <laughs> search for his blog. Maybe he has some words on that too. And I put here down his page with Autodesk. Uh, maybe you can have a look at. Uh, his personal page to get more information and now I'm really happy uh, to have him as a speaker and uh, yeah I'm looking forward to the talk and would hand over to uh, you Kim to start the presentation. I thank you before for your time and uh, yeah 
having us listening to your talk. Thank you, Michael. It's a it's it's a pleasure and a privilege to to have the chance to talk to you, um, talk to you all. So I'll be talking, as, as Michael said, I'll be talking about generative design for AEC, at least in, in terms of Autodesk's perspective on this and, and what we've been exploring. Um, so I'm part of Autodesk Research. Um, you can see my Twitter handle is KeyNW. You can find me on LinkedIn via KeyNW as well. And my blog is easy. It's KeyNW.com. So everything is 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 there via KeyNW.com or, or KeyNW. And there's my email address in case you'd like to contact me um you know but not via social media uh, so today yeah so i'll talk about generative design for ac a just a little introduction to myself first um so i first i, I joined autodesk in 95 so 20 just over 25 years ago um i hit my 25 25th anniversary um quite recently so for many years i was in the developer network team which is responsible for sort of helping our our software partners um use our our programming interfaces to our products and our and our and now our web our web services to to build software. And so I was I had a number of roles there on you know in, in in the technical areas. Um, you know I was I was speaking at conferences, giving training, providing support, and then I had a number of management roles as well related to 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 that. And then I moved across into the AutoCAD team as a as a software architect in 2012. I had the chance to move from being in a senior manager manager role to being across in as a software archi uh, software architect i should probably mention that my background is is, is in computer science so um that, that's where my, my my studies were uh then in 2016 i had the chance to join research and i've been focused on a, on a couple of main areas since joining research so one is related to um, building digital twins using Forge. So we weren't necessarily calling them digital twins when we started, but um, so one, one strong example there, and let me just maybe switch across. Can I do that without, I have to stop the slideshow, but um, some of you may be familiar with the, um, the nest, obviously the nest building. So I'm, I'm actually the main person responsible for building the front end for Dasher 360, which is, you can go to dasher360.com to check it out. And th this is a kind of a, a 3D environment that allows you to explore um, the, 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 the data coming off, coming off the nest building. Um, you know, from the various sensors that, 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 that are capturing data. And it's, and it's mainly for us, the, the exploration is, is or the, the, the research relates mostly to around the ability to take this, this data and, and display large amounts of data in, in 3D. So it's this, for example, this ability to, um, you know, essentially map uh, various types of data into, into the 3D space so that you can start to um, understand the, the, you know, the comfort um, uh, the, the, the documents are having in the building based on, based on, on sensor data. Um, so that's that's essentially what the what the digital twin related project is that I, that I want to just mention very quickly. Um, so I'd be happy to talk about that. I mean, this is my my main activity, in fact. So I'd be happy to talk about that um, at length uh, in a follow up. The other the other area that I'm focused on is, of course, generative design in the AEC space, and so that's the the main topic for today. Um, I've also moved around quite a bit for Autodesk over the years. So I started in the UK, hence, hence the accent. But then I first moved to Switzerland to the Neuchâtel area in 98. Um, and then I was actually very happy here, I have to admit, but I kind of made the mistake of choosing a, a job in the Bay Area in California for a few years, which was okay. But I, but I realized ultimately that, that I really wanted to come back. So I ended up um, with, with my wife's moving across to India for a couple of years on the way back to Switzerland. And we settled back here in 2006. Um, and since 2006, I've been writing this blog at keynw.com, which is which is which I mentioned earlier. It's called Through the Interface. It really started out as a blog to help um, software developers working with the AutoCAD build uh, build tools that, that work inside AutoCAD. But it's morphed along with my responsibilities in the company. So it, nowadays, I talk much more about the Forge platform um, and generative design. So I belong to Autodesk Research. Now this is a very old uh, graphic, unfortunately. Things have changed quite a bit since, since, since then. 
um, in terms of the, the structure, but it does give you some idea of the type of areas that, that Autodesk is, is, is researching actively. And, and it's important for me to point out that um, the, the, it's the living, um, which is, which is the, uh, an architectural studio that Autodesk acquired back in 2014, that's really been driving um, a lot of our research forward in this space. And, and the living is, is headed by David Benjamin, um, and essentially they are the ones who are really breaking the ground on a lot of these generative design projects. So I don't want to take any credit for having, having really done the hard, the hard stuff um, for these projects. I have been involved in a couple of them in, in a phase two kind of capacity where we've wanted to take that initial research and make something that's more publicly consumable. So that something that we can publish that people can download and play with. So that's really my role in these activities rather than doing the, the, the hard um, early research. Oops, so what is generative design? Um, in many ways, we can think about generative design as taking um, the principles of evolution and applying them in, into the design space. So in this case, we're you know, talking about sort of uh, Darwin's finches and, and the fact that they, they've evolved set differently over the years. We, we you know, over generations, we, we, we've, we talk about generative design as having this, this loop. So a generate, evaluate and evolve loop. Now, what that actually gen generally means from our perspective is that there's a parametric model, um, which you know, typically would be defined in, in something like Dynamo or Grasshopper, which has a number of inputs going into it. Uh, and then this model has the possibility of generating, you know, hundreds or thousands of different design solutions for that particular design problem. Then there's an, an evaluation component, which is generally built into that same graph. So typically we have uh, evalu you know, evaluators or metrics that will evaluate that design from various perspectives. So it's a, a fitness function essentially, or a number of them. So this can involve simulation. It can be, uh, you can involve things like daylight analysis, shortest path, um, you know, path of travel type, type um, analyses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then ultimately there's a, a, an optimization engine that, that makes use of some sort of genetic algorithm to, to evolve the, the parametric, the inputs to the parametric model based on what it's measuring in, in, the, in the outputs, in the metrics. So in terms of some of the projects that, that we've been involved in, in, I wanted to just introduce these, these four different projects. The first one being uh, the one that really launched uh, everything that we're doing at, at, at Autodesk, and that was a collaboration with Airbus. And then I'll talk about three projects that are, that are a bit more architectural in nature. Now, as, as Michael and I were chatting about earlier, there are some projects um, ongoing at Autodesk that relate to structural design or generative structural design, if you like. Um, but I'm not actually in a position to talk about them just yet. There is an event next week where we'll be talking where, where um, there may be some more news related to that. We have some user research um, at Autodesk University. And once again, I'll just quickly switch across to my browser and mention that. So if you go across to um, au.autodesk.com is the main place to, to, to do it, but here you can register for this, for this you know, one more free event um, that's, that's fully digital these days, or at least this year. Um, there's a lot of great content coming out of there. I have a talk um, that relates to my work on digital twins in case anyone's interested, but we do have some user research related to generative structural design, and I should be blogging about it in the next couple, in the next day or so. So you can also just sort of pay attention to kenw.com and, and, and head and, and, you know, find out about, about it from there. But as I said, so today is mostly, um, sort of architectural in, in, in nature in terms of the, the projects that I'll talk about. So the, the bionic partition. Now, this is an interesting one. Airbus came to us, um, and this is a, quite an old project now, but it is really the one that, that started everything. Uh, and Airbus came to us and said, well, we'd like to redesign a, uh, a partition in the A320. So it's a, at the moment, it's quite a, you know, it's a heavy partition. It's quite solid. Um, but it's, but as there are so many Air 3, A320s, well, maybe not right now, but in general, it's the, you know, it's the most flown aircraft um, commercially. It's, um, you know, it, 
just reducing the weight of this one partition would actually save, you know, many thousands of, of um, liters or gallons of, of, of fuel <clears throat> in terms of the, 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 the various aircraft that are flying with it. So this particular partition has, I believe, five different um, mounting points around it. It has, it has to be able to support the weight of the, the, um, the aircraft uh, crew who, who are sitting on it during aircraft, during um, takeoff and landing. It also has, has a, has a hole that this, this piece needs to come out in case they need to start moving stretchers around the, the, the cabin in, in case of emergency. So there are some requirements that, that are particular to this particular, to this partition. Now the, the living, when they approached this design problem, they took, started to take inspiration from slime mold uh, because they, they, looking at it, it, it sends out tendrils and, and connects food sources. And ultimately these ten, the tendrils that find food sources are strengthened and reinforced, whereas the, the, the tendrils that do not, you know, wither and die away. And it ends up creating this redundant, resilient network um, that is ultimately very um, interesting from a structural perspective as well. Now, they mapped that into uh, a parametric model, which could explore these various possibilities. And then they went through and, and uh, generated many thousands of, uh, of different um, design solutions or possibilities and they measured them in you know on two different two different metrics one is displacement and then one is weight and so this is the the final partition that is ultimately um the, well we displayed it i think at autisk university 2017 probably i think it was displayed um, it was, it's been 3D printed and it's been optimized both at the sort of the macro level, but then also at the, for the individual pieces, you can see, you maybe can see that there's obviously some light weighting that's gone on there. So there's, there's different levels of optimization that have taken place, at, 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 you know, for this piece. It wasn't printed all in one piece. It was 3D printed in sections and then assembled, of course. Um, so just talk a little bit about the, these these trade-offs. A lot of generative design is really around the the exploration of the of the different solutions that have been generated. And in this case, we're we're seeing that we have um, you know a Pareto frontier between the displacement and and the weight. Of course, if you look at the far left, of, you know we have a lot of you have designs that are that are very that are very light, but they're also not a, not very strong. So you know as you get to the left, there's, there's much higher displacement. Um, and then, of course, you get to the right, you have very strong designs, but they're ultimately, you know, too heavy for our, for, for our purposes. So it's, it's really about finding the, the appropriate um, sweet spot in terms of pulling out the, the designs that, the, that are of, in, of interest. The, this initial project really only had these two parameters, so it's pretty easy to explore the results. It's, it's really just displacement versus weight. But I'll talk more about the the way we're thinking around displaying results for um, higher dimensional problems later on. Um, so the, again, once again, this is the, the you, you know, I mentioned this generate, evaluate, evolve loop, which is something that, that we talked about. I, th I wanted to show this because it sort of talks about how generative design can fit into a kind of a larger um, a larger context. And the piece that's particularly of interest to me is this area here, which is where we're talking about, um, you know, collecting uh, performance data for designs via sensors, you know, in the Internet of Things and managing that data via some sort of digital twin. So what's going to be increasingly interesting over time is that as we gather data on the performance of designs in, in the wild or in the real world, we'll be able to, to gradually sort of have that data influence the, the, the generative process. So we have various people at Autodesk who are exploring the ability to um, influence generative design via neural networks that have been trained on, on performance data, et cetera. But this is increasingly going to start to get interesting, especially as then we can start to iterate um, a lot more efficiently. Uh, I've worked on a number of projects where we're very deliberately over-engineered the project. One, one, one great example is the, the, the MX 3D, 3D bridge, which is being installed in, in Amsterdam this week. And this is the world's first uh, 3D printed steel bridge 
Now, we've been involved in putting a sensor network inside the bridge in order to monitor how it performs. Now, clearly, this bridge was, was heavily over-engineered, but with that data, in theory, if there were to be future iterations on this design, you know, we could make use of that data in order to better understand um, or more optimally um, engineer the, the, the solution moving forward. So we're starting to, to, to think about how this can you know, this can also be applied in an AEC context or an architectural context as well. If we, we can do things like start to monitor how um, a space is used, we're doing a lot of behavioral um, monitoring via um, anonymized sort of skeletons that we're pulling out of, of video feeds via computer vision. So we can start to understand occupant behaviors in a space. Um, we have some ongoing work related to that. But we also understand, you know, we may have data in terms of how a space is projected to be used. Perhaps it's a co-working space and you have data on who has signed up to be using the space the next day. Well, based on the, our knowledge of how the space has been used in the past with that kind of occupancy, we can start to think about generating um, designs that, that would then allow the space to be automatically reconfigured overnight in order to meet the needs of the people that would be using it the next day. So that's the way we can start to think about this in terms of a, a broader um, ecosystem. So um, then I wanted to talk about these three architectural level projects. One, one is at the exhibit hall level. So this was for the Autodesk University 2017 exhibit hall. And, and these are the designs from the previous years that, that we were um, you know, we, we had as, as, as context for this. The, the way that the, the problem was basically broken down from a geometric perspective was that obviously we had, we had our constraints to the system in the sense that the floor plan was, was fixed. We weren't going to get more space. Um, you know, that's not something that was going to change. But then we had a parametric model that took as inputs the primary routes going through the space. And, and it's very common in, inside the generative design projects that I've been involved in, that we have a fairly small number of, of inputs. In this case, it's really just, you know, a, a, um, you know a, a, a number that indicates where along this, so, so it's parameterization of, of, you know, where we should place the, these, these avenues going through the space. So we have three different parameters here. And then ultimately everything else is driven off that. So we generate the primary routes, then there's subdivision that happens essentially automatically based on those, on those routes. Um, there's anchor programs uh, are located, and then there's some work to sort of join adjacent grid cells, you know, related to the area requirements. And then the, the, the cells get allocated, you know, ba ba based on the, the needs of the exhibitors, et cetera, et cetera. So then we had two metrics here as well. One is um, one that we've used a number of times and I'll talk about this again and it's called, it's buzz. And so the idea here is that we have, we want to encourage people to be, um, you know, taking the same routes in order to, to have serendipitous encounters and people. So to create a certain amount of, you know, energy in the space. Now, clearly in a, in a post pandemic world, we probably want to minimize buzz in many cases because we don't want people you know, bump, bumping into each other, and we want to try and try and optimize the space so that people have less contact. Um, but for this particular project, that was a requirement to maximize this this particular metric. And then the other one is a simple one, which is adjacency. So you know, trying to to reduce the travel time that people would have to go from particular parts of the of the plan of of the of the, of the, the layout to you know whether it's from from a particular exhibit exhibitor to another or uh, to, to the restrooms or to, to various amenities. So again, there was uh, a number of designs that were the, uh, or in this case, a lot, of, a lot of designs that were probably mostly randomly generated, though I'll talk more about optimization later. In this case, um, the, the randomness is useful in that it gives us a, a, a good, a, a broad, exploration of the of the space but it's not necessarily an intelligent search uh, but here we have exposure mapped against buzz and we can see the the over we we ran through oh we had to actually do an optimization run my apologies so we did 100 generations that that and these are the various designs that that were pulled out of that during the the, the 100 generations um and then 
let's see. So we so of those of those various results, there were three that proved to be of interest to move forward with and, and explore in more detail. So these are the the ones that are pulled out once again, kind of in this in this um, zone of interest along the sort of Pareto uh, Pareto frontier. So these are the, the three designs. One was actually chosen to explore more 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 completely and to be developed into the ultimate ultimate um, one that was chosen. So here we have the 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 uh, the printed design that was the that was then sort of turned into this for the for the exhibit itself. So the next one is is quite a commonly talked about example. This is the the um, the Autodesk office in Toronto, which is in the, the, the Mars district of, of Toronto. So Mars is uh, the medical and related sciences. Um, that's, that's the acronym. And it's a, an area of Toronto that is um, very interesting in the sense it's, I think the largest high-tech incubator in North America, in, you know, high, urban high-tech incubator. I think you always have to qualify these things so carefully. So these are the, the, the three floors that Autodesk has in, in the Mar dis Mars district, was it these three? Anyway, the, we, we have this space as well. And then I think we have some, some floors there too, but ultimately this is the, the space that Autodesk is, is occupying. Um, in order to uh, make the move from our previous office on, on um, King Street East, we, started by surveying um, people's interests in terms of what, what they wanted. And we started to explore these different goals in terms of under, you know, work, working out whether we could um, programmatically assess the quality of designs in terms of matching people's requirements. So we had um, these constraints that came into the system. We had these three floors, we had, um, constraints coming from our facilities teams in terms of how many meeting spaces, social spaces, et cetera, uh, amenities. We had from H our HR systems, we, we were told how many people had to be, um, uh, had, had to be located in the space and, and how the teams were, were made up. We also, so these were the ultimate, um, you know, the, the six goals that were ultimately decided upon. So we started with, um, uh, so we have distraction, whether it's audio, audible or, or, or visual, adjacency once again, which is sort of reducing the, the walking time that people would have to go to the restrooms or the elevators, interconnectivity. So once again, this is buzz, which we saw in the last, last example. So we wanted to, to, to maximize um, buzz in the office, daylight to make sure people had sources of natural light, and then views to outside to ensure that people could, from their desk, would at least be able to see a window. Now, work style was interesting in the sense it was a little uh, softer or fuzzier. This was really based on people's, um, uh, the, how they expressed their interests in terms of their work style. You know, what, what were they interested in, in terms of uh, the, the amount of noise in their space? Did they want to be somewhere that was light and airy or by a window? Or did they want to, to work somewhere that was a little darker? Um, so the, these were the sort of things that were pulled out by survey data. Once again, you know, we were able to generate these, uh, a number of designs. The way, the way that this actually worked, and, and I did an AU, AU talk about this from last year, Autodesk University talk, which, which explained in detail how the algorithm ultimately worked. And, and it, 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 it sort of, you know, we used a Voronoi pattern based on neighborhood areas to split up the space and into various into various neighborhoods, which we then allocated amenity blocks and, and desks. And then these were all score, scored on the various, um, the, these six metrics that I talked about. Ah, so actually this goes, this video goes into it in a little bit more detail. We can talk about it now. So this is a, a, a quite an interesting video. Um, so these are the constraints that we talked about. Ground floor, second floor, third floor, the, the requirements from HR and facilities, the goals in terms of you know, how we're going to measure each of the individual designs. So these are the ones that were based really on, on you know, how the, the, this survey data that, that, we, that we gathered from people in the office. And then we have the generate, evaluate, evolve loop, as I mentioned before a few times. 
So the ge geometric system that allows us to generate these various designs. So we had obviously the, the constraints of the space. We had uh, um, columns. We then had we we had two zones that were that were split into you know with the central spine with neighborhood points that would could be adjusted by the input parameters. And then these would cause the, the you would use this Voronoi pattern to split up the the zone based on those neighborhood centers and then allocate amenities and desks. And then just from that fairly simple geometric system, we're able to generate, you know, thousands of design options and use the, these um, metrics that were also coded inside the graph, whether it's for shortest path um, calculations to, to minimize the distance traveled, whether it's the work style preference to make sure that we, we did our best to map the preferences of individual teams in terms of their light and acoustic levels, and then buzz to maximize this, you know, the, the, the interactions that people would have going through the space. So productivity, we wanted to minimize visual and audio distraction. And then daylight, which is a, so we, we essentially took the, the, you know, did a daylight analysis for a year's worth of, of data um, for each design. And then views to outside, so just to measure uh, um, the the whether there was a, um, a straight straight line between people's desks and a and a window. So in terms of being able to 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 assess these various um, metrics, we've put quite a lot of work into you know thinking about different ways to to dis display this data, and I'll talk more about about this further, but. Ultimately, in terms of navigating through these various, you know, these various design options, you want to be able to map at least two dimensions, um, whether it's, you know, the metrics on the X and Y, but then also you want to measure, um, you know, we can also display them as color and, and size, which allows us to sort of map a four dimensional space into two dimensions. The ultimate design that was, was chosen um, is, was quite interesting. So I'll, well, we'll pause it here and talk about this a little bit. Oh, I was trying to pause it. Let me just go and go there. Uh, let's see. There we go. Let's try and stop there. All right, perfect. So if you look at the the, the design, it's kind of interesting in the sense um, it, it, it kind of looks like the the neighborhoods are fanning outwards from from a central space, which is not something that was coded into the 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 algorithm or the or the or the model in any way. I get the sense that it's probably an, you know, an emerging, an emergent property that comes from the various metrics and the way we've, we've, you know, we're, we're measuring and, and, in, and encouraging the optimization process. So the, I, I think this is coming from, it, it could be, you know, the daylight analysis, the views to the outside. So they're also, you know, probably reinforcing this alongside the, um, the path of travel or the, you know, minimizing or, you know, increasing adjacency between spaces. But it's very interesting because it's, because it is something that, that is not specifically coded in, but it is something that looks like it was an emergent property. I think we need to do some more analysis um, in terms of understanding what's going on there. The, these are a couple of the floor plans um, that, that have come out. And I think it's worth noting that things look a little different from a, from a normal floor plan. So here, for example, you have this somewhat, you know, marked lack of orthogonality uh, because, you know, things have been literally placed and optimized based on, by, by a computer in order to, to, to make things more efficient. But it, it does, it's, it is questioning certain biases that we may have as designers to want to sort of put things down in an, ortho, in an orthogon, orthogonal way um, we're formatted to, to think about design problems in a certain way. So I think this is, this is interesting in the sense it does cause us to question um, our biases and, and why it is that we've decided to, to look at a design problem in, in a certain, from a certain perspective. So there's some interesting things that have been called out specifically here. So I mentioned the, the, the non-orthogonality. Um, also, you know, gaps have been left in certain areas that again, probably wouldn't have been done in that way, but it, it really improves the adjacency between neighborhoods. So once again, the algorithm has, has sort of found, or the, or the process has found these 
these interesting solutions, even if the, we don't necessarily want to take the designs that come out of the generative process. It's very interesting to have that, have the inspiration from this process, if you like, but then also um, be able to, uh, you know, have the data that, that tells us why is it that it's performing better than different design. So I think there's a lot to be said um, for the, you know, being able to use these results, uh, whether it's directly or just as inspiration for then going ahead and trying to look at the problem from a different perspective. So the space itself is interesting. Uh, it's, it, this is, um, you know, the, so there's a number of my colleagues here in these photos. The, this was a fun one in the sense they took the, oops, the, the results of the daylight analysis and used that to, to color code the, the space or, 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 you know, paint the walls and then the carpet area as well, which is, which is pretty interesting. Um, this is the, the research area. So they have this sort of central bullpen where the um, interns and, and temporary employees are with, with closed offices around the outside at the top for the full-time researchers. And yeah, so, so ultimately I should probably say that um, I had thought I had another photo there, but there's um, the space itself does feel a bit different in the sense that there's a lot of strange angles and, and, when we asked the people who, who built the space, you know, who are, you know, essentially were responsible for doing the construction, they did say that it, that it was actually more complicated to do than a typical project, just because there were a lot of strange angles that were not 90 degrees, which of course we could have built in a constructability metric of, of some way, because there is an impact in terms of budget and, and resources needed. But we, also wanted to do something that was a little bit provocative and interesting. So I think it's, it's in a sense, it's, it's for us, it was uh, something that we didn't really want to take into account too much um, because we did want to uh, do something that looked like it was a little bit different. So the next project that I was involved in um, related to this space was, was actually at the urban scale. So this is going a bit beyond the, the, the architectural scale. Um, in the, and it was for Van Wijnen, who's there's a Dutch um, construction and development company that's often um, using interesting techniques. They're, they're doing a lot of off-site off fabrication. Here you can see they, they're using um, augmented reality to sort of look at some, um, you know, to map schematics onto, onto a floor, I guess. Um, now, this was the the project that we that we embarked on with them. So this was the 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 ultimate um, boundary for this um, for this particular area. And once again, geometrically, the way it worked was that we create a boundary aware mesh from that initial boundary, parameterize the roads um, in that space, which then led to the space being subdivided into lots and, and then into regions. And then essentially we used a parceling, some parceling logic to decide where the, the houses and the apartments should best be placed just based on those initial roads. But it's really the roads that indicated the, you know, the, the, the geometry for the whole space. There was another option, which was really around the percentage of, of um, apartments, but really it's the, it's, it's the roads that, that drove everything from a geometric perspective. And then in terms of the metrics, this time we had seven metrics, backyard size, views, solar gain, profit cost, and then program and variety. Once again, we, you know, the, the, the algorithm went ahead and generated a lot of different solutions. And then we, we provided a, uh, and uh, th this was an early version of the exploration interface that has since been sort of built into to Autodesk Revit. And this has uh, allowed us to map metrics both on X and Y, but then also size and color as well. So once again, allowing us to essentially uh, map a 4D space into 2D. Of course, if we had VR, then we'd have a fifth dimension as well that we'd be able to explore. But um, that's something that I'm sure somebody will develop at some point. So we were able to pull out the, you know, interesting designs in this case, looking at mainly looking at, at profit versus sort of solar gain. Um, and then, you can, you know, you can see the, the Pareto frontier here and they pulled out a few designs, one of which was, was further developed 
for that particular project. So those are the, the four examples I wanted to, to talk through before we get into some of the more specifics around how it all works. So we talked about the Airbus example, which really just had two goals similarly, to, you know, just as we had two goals for the, the, the Autistic University Exhibit Hall. And then we sort of moved up in complexity for the um, Mars office and then once again for the Van Wynen project. Actually, maybe uh, so, Michael. I don't know if it's a, if it's good to stop briefly for questions, or whether we should just keep them to the end. I'll... <clears throat> for me, um, it's uh, okay. So, if if we want to uh, have a, a discussion at this point, for me, it's perfectly fine that uh, people, yeah, just uh, unmute themselves and uh, ask questions because we have time. <laughs> okay. So, so what, I, th I think it'd be good to take questions on on these projects perhaps first before mm -hmm. we start to get into the specifics. Though, though if there is an answer, a question that's going to be answered by subsequent slides, I will say so, so that we don't... Um... Oh, I would say maybe we continue. Okay, with... perfect. Sorry? Yeah. So oh. I just wanted some, maybe explain a little bit about the more con concrete aspects of, of working with, with generative design. Um, and this is sort of a graph that looks a little bit at where, we, where we've come from and where we're heading in terms of the, 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 the process. So obviously we, you know, we, between CAD and, and parametric modeling or BIM and then visual programming that, that allows this sort of a more computational design approach, which is still ultimately parametric design at some level. Um, but as we move forward, we're talking more about either um, e exploration of a design space using our option generation or optioneering or starting to get into, um, you know, the, the, the real, you know, intelligent search of a space use, using optimization. And this is where a tool that we've project, which was known as Project Refinery. Unfortunately, I didn't, up, up, didn't update these slides, but it's now integrated into uh, Revit 2021, I think. So that's where you can get access to, to, to these tools today. Um, so this is really where, um, where we're focused on at the moment. And I mentioned this before, but ultimately we have this idea of, of input parameters that will drive the parametric model in some way. And these are very typically, new, or these, I think they have to be numeric sliders that are marked as inputs. And then you have your, your metrics that are just sort of watch windows, um, or sorry, yeah, watch nodes that, that have a numeric output. Um, and then, really we have this, once again, this generate, evaluate, evolve loop. So we have the parametric model, the metrics that are also built into the Dynamo graph once again, but outside of the graph, we have this optimization engine, uh, which we've built into project refinery and then also now into to generative design for Revit, which is, which is going to take the inputs, um, measure the outputs and then assess in which direction it should tweak the, the inputs in order to get better results. And it does this generation on generation. So here we can see for the sort of the, the initial population of designs where we have the first generation. These are generally um, uh, generated randomly for the initial set. So the various outcomes will be assessed. Some will be taken forward to, to the next generation. Um, <clears throat> so they're based on the highest performing di designs from the from the previous generation, and then you go from generation you know to up to generation n. Now the actual algorithm under under the hood that we have so far used is NSGA two, which is uh, non dominated sorting generic genetic algorithm two. There's a link to the to the to the paper here. It's from two thousand two. I imagine that many of you are already familiar with this, but ultimately it's a, it, it's a, a mechanism that we, that we have used in order to, to determine the, the higher um, performing designs. There are of course other um, algorithms out there. It's not something that we've chosen to expose as an option to users because ultimately um, right now we are focused on making a tool that is more uh, consumable by, a, by a, a, a larger number of people. So starting to, to get into the domain of allowing people to, ch to choose a particular genetic algorithm is, is probably a, a level of complexity that's a bit too much. Um, but so for now, we've, we're focused on NSJ2, but it's not 
uh, doesn't mean we, we couldn't necessarily switch across to, to use something else in time or, or to find a different um, way of exposing that to customers. So um, here, this is again, sort of seeing how generative design may, may fit into a, a larger process or, or workflow. Um, we have, uh, so, so most of what we're doing in generative design is, is based around Dynamo. So there's um, a link here that will allow you to sort of go ahead and find out some more. I've actually got a page of links that I've uh, put towards the end of the presentation that you can also go ahead and, and, and take a look at. Um, the beta itself of refinery, I don't, I assume that it's over at this stage, you know, in order to get access to it, you'll need to install Revit 2021. And then you have um, the generative design feature sort of built into, built into that. Now, um, to give you a sense of, of how it works, it is running locally. It's not running on, based on, on the cloud, at least not at the moment. Um, and it uses these same algorithms, the same optimization algorithms that we used in these various research projects that I mentioned earlier, whether the, the AU 2017 exhibit hall or the, the Mars um, office redesign. And then it allows you to sort of sync once you've done your, you know, as you're doing your, your exploration of the results, you can then take those selected designs and, and show them either in, in Dynamo or in Revit itself, depending on on, on what sort of geometry that you're dealing with. So the graph needs to tell Refinery about its inputs and outputs because Refinery is gonna load um, the graph up and then scan through for nodes that are important to it. So it's gonna scan through for the inputs and it's gonna scan for the outputs. And <clears throat> uh, the, um, let's see, what's anything men worth mentioning? I don't really need to talk too much about that. I, you know, I won't go into the details of, of how things can be made to work in Dynamo itself, because I think that's beyond, beyond the scope for, for this particular session. But in terms of creating the study, there are, there are a number of different types of study that you can create inside the, the generative design interface. So you can do a, an optimization run, which is the main one, of course, but you can also do a completely random run, which is just gonna take random, random input values for your various parameters within the constraints of what, what you've specified for them, of course. You can also do a cross product. Now it's a kind of an unfortunate ter piece of terminology in the sense it's, it's probably more accurately a Cartesian product. But anyway, it's essentially taking each parameter and then splitting it up um, into an even number or sorry, into, you know, parameterizing it evenly based on the, the number of designs for each that you've chosen for each one. And then it just sort of multiplies those out um, via, via a Cartesian product in order to, to um, systematically explore the solution space, which is something you wouldn't necessarily get from a randomization run and, and not from an optimization run. But of course, because of the granularity and the, the you know, of, you, you're very unlikely to find your ideal solution with a, with a Cartesian product or cross product run. And then like this is just going to take the existing parameters and tweak, tweak them very slightly and find a solution that, that looks a little bit like this, but not necessarily um, the same. So um, in terms of the, the way this works, you've got the ran randomization, literally just gonna take um, random inputs and then you, you have your design space. And then you have, you know, however many designs the, the user has chosen will get created randomly. For cross product, it'll, you'll specify that you want perhaps five for each parameter or five for one parameter, three for another. And then it's going to generate um, those, those 15 solutions, <clears throat> excuse me, the, an optimization run is going to do a more intelligent search of the design, uh, the, or the solution space. So generation on generation and there, it, it says you may have uh, 18 designs, but very often you're going to have fewer because you'll have the, the, the best designs in generation one may still be you know, the best designs in generation two or three or whatever, you know, there are, um, there's no guarantees that they're going to be improved upon. So in fact, this isn't probably perfectly accurate in the sense we're, we're doing a, you know, we are carrying forward 
the, the better designs from one generation to the next. And then like this, as I said, it's really just going to um, tweak the parameters slightly and come up with a, um, you know, a, a number of solutions that are similar to the ones that, 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 you're, that you have currently loaded. So a few examples. Um, this is, this is I, you know, I, when I often talk to people about getting started with, with generative design, I, 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 I discourage people from loading up the samples that are too complicated. This is one that, for example, I, I created, which allows you to just, you know, you input a floor plan and it ultimately just tweaks the, the angle and the spacing of the, of the tiles in that space in order to, and then it measures, you know, how much waste there is. Um, you can start to tweak things like, you know, you, obviously you'll start to choose the aesthetics based on, on, on the angle, et cetera, but it's really giving you a number of, of solutions for a very simple problem. Um, you'd ultimately think, well, this is even worth applying to that, but it is interesting that you'll, you do start to get, to get useful results, even from something that's this small. And it is useful. I think it is, it is valuable to start small and not necessarily go to get too complicated with it. The next example was some one that we did, and this is really because we couldn't share the Van Wynen um, example publicly that we decided to build something that was kind of similar, but not exactly. In this case, the, the problem was to, uh, to design the, the, a new um, quad area inside a, on, on a campus. So we imported, I think, the, the geometry um, from I think the, the campus of Carleton University in, in, in Ontario, Ottawa, anyway, in Canada somewhere. Um, and then we did, we added some additional things that weren't in the original Van Wynum graph, which allowed us to, we, we used a, a package that we call the space analysis package to do sort of shortest paths between the entrances for the various university buildings and the center of this, this quadrangle. We also did some visibility analysis so that any of the, the entrances that were in, not visible from the center of the quadrangle could potentially be a security risk. You know, there could be attacks on campus. So we decided to color those red versus the ones that are green that are more visible and, and less likely to, to run into issues there. So that's just to say that we did some pathfinding and visibility analysis inside this particular graph as well. And then the, you know, the, the, reinvention of the original um, graph that I, I talked about when we talked about the Mars office. We've recreated this for people to consume um, publicly using, using Dynamo. So you can get that from, from this link as well. So I was, I was very involved in, in this particular, um, developing this particular graph. Okay. Um, so this is probably, is this a, oh, this maybe is a, a walkthrough video showing how refinery can, can be used. Um, in this case, yeah, let's see, I can't remember how, so this is, this is fairly similar to the way the user interface will probably look still inside Revit. I think it does look a little bit different, but when you generate an, um, an, a new study, you sort of go through and you choose to minimize, maximize, or ignore your various um, output parameters. And then you can specify the number of generations and the size of each generation in terms of the population. And then it'll go ahead and, and, and generate um, the, the various solutions. And as they sort of come, they, they, they'll populate inside this, this uh, scatter, gra scatter plot graph. Uh, I can move forward a bit. So it's creating these various designs. Um, and then you've got different ways of exploring the, um, the solutions, whether it's a scatter plot, where you start to plot the different um, output parameters in X and Y. So there we're kind of comparing adjacency with buzz. Uh, we could also, you know, change the, the color as well to be, to be a, a, another output parameter like views to outside. And then the, color will change to work style. And then, but there are other ways to explore as well. I'm not sure if we show it, but we, there is the sort of parallel coordinate view. Um, so here, as you hover over different solutions or, or select them, you can then um, send those parameters through to the, to, to Dynamo. 
um, or, or to Revit if you're running it inside Revit. Okay, so that I think is a quick overview there of the, the UI. These are the links I wanted to show you in terms of um, getting started. You know, we have the, um, just getting started with Dynamo generally, there's a really active forum if you have questions that you need to get answered. Um, there are two main programming languages inside Dynamo that you may want to look into. One is DesignScript, the other is Python. And then for Refinery or the generative engine, then you can either go to um, this, which I think is probably out of date now, though it may just point you to Revit, or, and this is, this is another option, which I think I'll take a quick look at, this is the generative design primer. And this is very, this is very interesting in the sense it sort of goes through um, from A to Z, how you can really make use of, of generative design. It talks about um, the, excuse me, it talks about a number of examples. Um, so some of them are familiar. You've seen these, I've talked about some of these today. Um, so it's it's in, probably interesting to, to to take a look at this. So just go to generativedesign.org and you'll you'll find more information about how everything works. Okay, and I think that's probably it for the for the slides. Though you know I can probably bring up exam other examples if people have question more questions at this stage. Okay. Yeah thank you so far. Thank you for watching this video. My name is Dr. Michael Kraus and as part of the leading team of the Design++ Plus Plus initiative, I hope you enjoyed it. We are looking forward to listening to future great talks soon. We will inform you in due time about the next speaker of this series. Stay tuned and sneak by our channel soon again.